Meet node. This node represents an individual. With just two nodes, we can represent a simple system. In any system, there are two basic ways nodes can interact with each other. The first way can be referred to as command and control because in this system, one node gives the orders while the other carries out the orders. The second way can be referred to as free exchange because the relationship is more reciprocal, which is to say cooperative and voluntary. Systems built around free exchange are called networks. Systems built on relationships of command and control are called hierarchies. In a hierarchy, layers of command and control form from the top down. At the top, nodes issuing commands are in ultimate control. Near the bottom, nodes carry out orders sent from above and then send information back up the layers of hierarchy. During this process, however, some information can get lost. Imagine a game of telephone you might have played as a kid. As chains of hierarchy lengthen and more layers are introduced, more information is lost. Controller nodes have more difficulty issuing commands and making decisions. In a network, activity happens from the bottom up, which is to say there are no controller nodes. Rather, peer-to-peer -peer relationships form in collaboration. Networks are often more efficient and are less likely to lose information because said information, not to mention decision-making power, is usually more evenly distributed around the system. Of course, without a single node in charge, networks are limited in their ability to make a single system-wide course of action. Networked orders achieve a sweet spot between the rigid order of a hierarchy and the chaos of unconnected nodes. But without certain ordering forces that preserve the network's integrity, dissolution can result. We'll return to these ordering forces in a moment. Which system do you think is sustainable? Scalable? Of course, we all know that certain hierarchies can suffer from inefficiency, waste, path dependence, which you might think of as organizational bad habits, and mission creep. Despite these problems, hierarchies can still perform intact. But there are organizational limits to hierarchies. Three ways hierarchies reach their limit are separation, collapse, or transition. With separation, part of a hierarchy splits off to form another smaller, more manageable hierarchy. With collapse, either information breakdown occurs or centralized control from the top down is lost. The system, well, collapses. With transition, the network begins to deal with the increased information and increased complexity by flattening the hierarchy, which is to say it begins making a transition from hierarchy into a network. In returning to our very simple two-node hierarchy, we might say that the nature of the relationships between the nodes changes from one of commands to one of collaboration. So, if we were to take our two basic types of systems and scale them up to the level of society, what would we get? In other words, what kinds of social orders result from large-scale hierarchies and large-scale networks? Hierarchical social orders are known as planned orders, or centrally planned societies. Networked social orders are known as spontaneous orders, a term coined by Friedrich August von Hayek. What are some examples of planned social orders? Government bureaucracies, socialist economies, some family households, some companies. Of course, each of these systems can vary in their relative ability to function well as hierarchies, but all are marked by their top-down command and control organization. What are some examples of spontaneous social orders? Ecosystems market economies, the internet. Of course, there are some transitional or hybrid organizations with characteristics of both a hierarchy and a network, but spontaneous orders are marked far more by characteristics of the latter. What are the defining characteristics of a spontaneous order? Peer-to-peer, -peer, interaction is voluntary, networked, and reciprocal. Decentralized, power centers tend to break up and spread out continuously. Prosperous, marked by continuous value creation. Complex, 
So complex in its totality, it's unknowable by any individual or group. Scalable. Virtually no limits to growth and development. Failures to make complexity transitions are well known. One obvious example is the former Soviet Union, whose command and control economy collapsed in the early 1990s. So how, at least in abstract terms, can systems make complexity transitions? Apply a principle of subsidiarity, which is similar to federalism. The principle of subsidiarity says, all decisions should be made at the most local feasible level. In other words, make decisions close to the action. A corollary is, all tasks should be carried out locally in as much as possible. Keeping decision-making and execution closer to the action ensures individual nodes address issues and problems they're most familiar with. The effect of subsidiarity is that it flattens hierarchies, or they begin making complexity transitions as greater decision-making power moves from higher nodes to lower nodes. Hierarchies transform into networks. Spontaneous orders can begin to emerge. Now, if spontaneous orders are more scalable and more sustainable forms of order, how is it that they emerge? Spontaneous orders emerge by virtue of three factors. Institutions, transactions, and specialization. First, institutions. These social rules are basic to any spontaneous order. The other two factors, transactions and specialization, depend upon institutions. Institutions are societal rules that lower transaction costs. That is, make it easier to interact and trade. Institutions fall into two basic types, formal and informal. Formal institutions are legal, enforceable societal rules such as those found in a constitution. Formal institutions may include property rights, individual rights, rule of law or contract, and third-party adjudication. Informal institutions are unwritten norms of conduct, such as trust signals, neighborhood watch, honoring debts, ethical behavior, and a basic culture of respect for formal institutions. Institutions are special kinds of rules in that they are meant to regularize behavior, not regulate it. For example, consider the rule drive on the right, as opposed to drive to destination X. In that way, we say that institutions are non-teleological rules versus teleological rules. Another way of talking about rules is to return to the idea of ordering forces in a system. Let's distinguish between these two very different types of rules, teleological and non-teleological. Teleological rules come from the Greek telos, which means aim or goal. Teleological rules are thus goal-oriented rules. Alternatively, non-teleological rules include no aim or goal, therefore do not include any direct commands. In this way, non-teleological rules tend to prescribe limits on behavior. For example, a rule of non-harm, you won't harm me if I won't harm you, doesn't prescribe some specific course of action leading to some end. It merely sets boundaries on our behavior so that we can each be free to live our lives as we choose. The term spontaneous order is pretty abstract. So another way we might describe spontaneous order is social ecosystem. If society is a kind of ecosystem, what are institutions? Institutional rules are social DNA. But what do DNA and institutions have in common? Basically, they are simple rules for a complex world. Remember CTGA from biology class? Cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine? These are the four amino acids that make up DNA. So while a strand of DNA might get pretty complicated, and the life forms they express even more complex, they are still all combinations of C, T, G, and A. Four simple amino acids in DNA are enough to determine the rules for forming highly complex organisms living in wider global ecosystems. So, what would social DNA look like? 